Hello world, welcome back. <laughs> uh, I'm Christina, for anyone that doesn't know me, and this is my lovely friend Nona. Uh, hello, hello. <laughs> we are here today live from Brooklyn, New York, and Queens, New York, right? Queens. Ooh. I bet I'm the only one of your guests from Queens. It's possible. Mm. I mean, I don't have a full mental list of where everyone is from, but I did have someone call from California, so that was cool. Exotic. Uh, it was very exotic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, we'll see. Um, I mean, that's kind of the exciting thing, though, too, is that uh, the more we go, we'll see more more insides of apartments. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but for anyone that doesn't know you, Nona, do you want to maybe uh, explain a little bit about how you got into this whole business to begin with? Um, sure. So I am a DP and I have been, I, I've been, I guess it's so weird to say cinematographer, but I've been working exclusively as a cinematographer, as a DP for at least the last five or six years. Um, before that, I was, <laughs> I thought you were telling me time out. I'm like, what are, did I already No, it's a, this an air flap. <laughs> On the Zoom. She's a um, cinematographer, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Real club. Um, yeah, before that, I was. I, I still work as a, as an operator from time to time. I love opping for for other DPs. Um, I was working as a first AC. Um, before that, as a second AC. So my, I didn't have a, a strategy at all, but. I guess my plan was just to stick as close to camera department as possible until I figured out how to do the thing that I do. And I think I'm almost close to figuring out how to do the thing that I do. But you know, who were knows? you, did you always know that it was going to be camera like after school? Did, was that like pretty clear? Um, well, even with uh, deciding on a school, I always knew that I, I guess like, my my intention was originally to go into fine arts. So I had been um, studying um, to do painting and drawing and um, yeah, whatever constitutes like fine art education. Um, and at one point, film just seemed like a better way to make money jokes on me <laughs> um then becoming a visual artist but um you know so i gravitated towards the aspect of filmmaking that was the closest to the thing that i loved about um you know about about fine arts so just like i wanted to craft an image and uh the medium at that point didn't matter whether that was with charcoal or paint um now it became the the visual language of film but I actually didn't know what it meant to be a cinematographer when I went to film school. I was just kind of putting those pieces together because I didn't have any kind of legacy uh, in terms of like anybody in my family working in the film industry. Um, I didn't know any filmmakers personally. So all I had as a point of reference were the movies that I liked to watch, but I had never really given much thought to who does what in the creation of this thing that we all enjoy to um to view so going to to film school i don't it didn't really clarify <laughs> a lot of those things um i went to a film school that was focused on directing and writing um and that kind of wanted us all to be auteurs um it wasn't by any means like a, a technical school really and it wasn't um, focused on camera departments. So again, I had to kind of pick up bits and pieces. Um, I just knew that I wanted to be the person responsible for the image. So a lot of it was just self-educating and, and trying different things and um, figuring out how to put the pieces together myself. Um, yeah, you're gonna edit this, right? Because I already we'll, we'll, like I <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but for anyone that doesn't know, maybe do you want to describe a bit more about um, your 
experience between what was NYU film school mm -hmm. and then the, was it a master's program that you did in Europe? It was, yeah. How much time uh, was there in between or did you kind of go from one or the right to the other? So what happened, yeah, so I went to NYU film undergrad and um, again, it's, it's really a place for writers and directors and that what's program and there are some really amazing cinematography professors and there are some really amazing courses that I was able to take but they were few and far between because it's not a conservatory by any means um, and I really didn't get a chance to take those courses until I was uh, a junior and then a senior and I think the breakthrough really happened my junior year when I did a study abroad program in the Czech Republic at Prague, um, well, it's FAMU and it's it's the it's the state film school um, okay. and performing arts um, in Prague, and we did a study abroad program, and we that program was focused entirely on cinematography and on thirty five millimeter cinematography. So it was the first time that I had used film. Um, we had shot on 16 mil in, uh, in our classes, but it was the first time that I had used 35 millimeter film. Um, and it was my first taste of a structured cinematography program and doing an entire semester of that with no other coursework besides camera classes was a dream come true. Um, and that was late into my junior year. So I came back to New York and I, I had this like totally new understanding of camera department and and what to aim for now um, but it was still very difficult to supplement what I had learned there with what we were doing at NYU still um, and when I started working you know after I graduated, I, I really just needed to make money and I couldn't call myself a DP and I certainly didn't have the technical skills to, to op or to AC or to do anything like that. So I just kind of took any kind of jobs that were close to filmmaking and that meant I worked in art department. I worked as, a, as an art director and as like a props person for, for small stuff. Um, I did a lot of like live videography. I did a lot of like music videos. Um, I did a lot of small doc shoots, but very, very few of them were fulfilling and very few of them felt like they were pushing me in the right direction. Um, I was really just floundering. Um, and I did this for a few years um, where, again, I said yes to every kind of job that brought me a little bit closer to, to film. And at one point, a former professor of mine from FAMU, from Prague, got in touch with me and he said, you know, we're, we're developing this new curriculum um, within the Czech film school. Um, it is going to be taught kind of half in Czech, half in English. Um, we want to bring international students, but we want to integrate them into the Czech study program, right? So not part of the international program that I didn't study abroad, but it's kind of like new section that would be under the wing of the Czech program for the Czech oh, students. Oh, interesting. Okay. And yeah, so so he encouraged me to apply and I got together. We did the same application process that the Czech students do in the Czech Republic for this program. So we had the same um, assignments. We had the same portfolio requirements. We had the same, um, we needed to get recommendation letters. Um, it was a pretty, like, we had a few interviews. It was relatively, like, rigorous, um, but it gave me something to aim for and to, to shoot for. I did a few uh, short films as a, as a DP to specifically for this application, um, and I got in, and the FAMU program is a conservatory. I mean, it is like a, when you go to school in the Czech Republic, starting with your bachelor's, you choose, um, an area to, I mean, you don't just do everything, you choose to either be- Your craft specific. Exactly, study. exactly. So, and then you don't, you don't change. You choose it at the beginning of the bachelor's program and you do five years, three years of bachelor's and then two years of, of master's. Um, so we were a strange case in that we were entering it in the master's program, but all of our Czech classmates had already done the bachelor's studies. So they 
the, the faculty trying to figure out kind of like at what level to take us mm. because we had such different backgrounds and, and such different like life and work experiences and we're all varied in various ages as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of, we were like the guinea pigs. <laughs> there are definitely a lot of kinks in the system, but the quality of the education was so good. And it was totally, totally focused on the craft. And it was totally focused on everything from the technical aspects of cinematography to the scientific aspects of cinematography. We did a lot of, um, you know, physics of light, the, the chemistry of film development, um, the like lighting and color theory, just, everything really dissected and explored and evaluated from an engineering side, from a physics side, from a mathematical side. Um, it gave us the building blocks, I think, to be creative because before it was just, I had an image that I wanted to emulate and I had no idea what it went mm. in, what went into crafting that image. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can, you can look up the specs for something. Of course, you could see what camera was used, what lenses were used. Um, but until you really understand what these things do, it's kind of hard to have them be malleable enough so that you could use them in your own project or for to serve your own purposes. Um, Did you feel like that program helped sort of define or at least start to identify what maybe your aesthetic was or your style was in your making? Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't think I have an aesthetic or a style per se. Um, I think I'm just always after quality. So whatever script or project I'm presented with, I just want to make it, you know, just make it good, like make it of a high enough standard and uh, serve the story and serve the message. And um, be a vessel for whatever the director or the client wants to communicate. Um, I'm still figuring out my own aesthetic. Like I know personally what I like and I explore a lot of that through my photography. It's a lot easier to explore through photography because you only need yourself and the world outside or the subjects to shoot, but you don't need a full crew um to to make an, a beautiful image um so that's my time to kind of like test things out everything from testing like actual film stock and shooting on film stock um with a, a with a stills camera to just figuring out what it is that i would want to incorporate in the films that i do um but you, you know back to your question i think like what it helped with is that um it helped me watch films differently, ask different questions of how they came to look the way that they look, um, and start asking myself those same questions of, well, if I want to do this, like, how is this achieved? Is this possible within um, this budget range? Or is it possible within, you know, these resources that I'm handed? And um, if anything, it just helped organize my own understanding of what I don't know. Because <laughs> there's a lot that I don't know <laughs> and before this goal it was just this like big like mess and super nebulous it just, just I didn't know it but I didn't know how to get the information that I needed and the school helped me organize that information so at least I know where to turn to when I don't know something um and I think that that kind of like that shift in my mentality helped more than the actual knowledge that I gained there or and I wouldn't even you know talk about like the the hands-on experience that I had because being in Prague um, you have this ex accessibility to um, they have Panavision Prague right there they have uh, Vantage they have the film labs at, at Berendov and it's all kind of like in this cluster and the film community is so small that when you're a student at the school, you're automatically welcomed into this film community and you have this immediate access to these big established, you know, um, players that wasn't possible at NYU. Like nobody gives a shit if you're an NYU student, you know, like nobody cares. Everybody's, <laughs> but as a student somewhere, you're not going to get special treatment just for that. Whereas in Prague, you have this kind of like big fish, small pond situation because there are only a select few who do this thing. 
Yeah. And the school was a way to get a, your foot in the door. And immediately these other doors swung open. So even if you weren't on the biggest projects that shoot in Central Europe, and there are a ton of them that shoot in Central Europe, um, you could at least go to those sound stages. You could use the same labs for processing. You were renting gear at the same places. Um, you felt like you were a part of this conversation and it was a really good place to learn because you just you just saw how the way things were done. Um, and yeah, that was, that was something that I, I certainly did not get in New York. Um, but it, it gave me a little boost of confidence coming back to New York, knowing that I had worked alongside those people and now I could kind of take that energy and, and bring it home with me. Yeah, I have to say, I feel like it's really interesting to think about um, our industry and our crafts as not being so isolated. We need all these other uh, people and communities and craftspersons and tradespersons to really take a vision and make it real life. And I feel like when you can, when you focus just on the cameras or just on camera people, the strongest camera people I know are the ones that utilize the community and utilize these collaborators because it's really not in a vacuum, you know? And yeah. I think it, if anything, like the more I watch certain movies or talk to certain people, it's not like this person's name stamped all over it. It's yeah. just all the people they worked with. Um, so I was curious if you can maybe talk a little bit about maybe some collaborators that you've worked with the longest or certain types of collaborations that you find exciting. Um, I think as visual people, we're always searching for those um, magical collaborators uh, that we're just going to click with instantly. And it becomes more than just a technical collaboration, but it becomes this creative collaboration where you vibe on all of these levels and you automatically like speak the same language. Um, I've found that like my, my friend group and my collaborator group, it's that Venn diagram is, you know, just a circle because the people that I, I love to spend time with offset are the same people that I love to spend time with on set. Um, and there's a big part to that because if I can spend 16 hours a day with you and we're still friends by the end of the day, then that speaks volumes. Um, yeah. and I feel like the people that I've surrounded myself with, and that I've been so fortunate to, to bump into by circumstance, you know, like yourself, you know, they're, they're the people that I continue to be close with, not just on a, on a technical level, but also on like, you know, what's, what's up, let's do literally anything else in the world because I feel comfortable around you. Um, and I think that's just kind of like shared tastes and, and shared like work ethics and uh, shared ethics generally that, um, you bring into your circle and um, you try to make creative collaborations work too because we want to work with each other. It's, it's a pleasure to spend time together. So you want to create something with the same people too. I have to say, I think that's my probably favorite part about being in this industry. And for anyone that isn't really familiar with the behind the scene world, uh, so many of us work freelance and in, yeah. on independent projects. We're not just like owned by Netflix or owned by HBO. We, we do these different projects and, and tell these different stories. And by doing so, you get to meet some really cool people along the way. But in that, you know, we also sometimes spend, you know, anywhere from 10 to 18 hours a day with people. So it's pretty cool when you do meet people that you enjoy them still after 18 hours and you yeah. want to still hang out with them to get a drink or get coffee or somehow, I don't know, do other things. Uh, and, um, yeah, I just think that that's, um, to me, that's really exciting that we have that opportunity. Not everyone gets that. No, um, I love it. But it's also kind of nuts, too, if you think about it, because some, I think some members of our community can get very tied to a project or to a certain, dare I say, paycheck. And so it can be then hard to navigate or even remember why you got into it in the first place, yeah. because you're so used to like, oh, you know, there is a certain regularity to this and, yeah. you know, I can expect something from these makers, whereas there's still a significant group in the population that work on such this crazy, um, I don't know, version of all the different things in between. Yeah. Um, but let's see here. I have a question for you about 
I feel like I want to like use some like gif or some like flying rainbow at the screen. Inspiration. <laughs> because I feel like for anyone, again, that doesn't know, uh, it's always a really uh, ambiguous land between projects. Yeah. Uh, and generally, if you're working, you're working. Everyone's like, yeah, you're working. Um, but sometimes, you know, it doesn't just line up perfectly. Like I finish a uh, feature and then the next feature starts the next week. Sometimes there's overlap or yeah. sometimes there's months in between. And um, clearly we're all underneath this COVID umbrella right now, which is a whole other <laughs> type of uh, world. Uh, so I was just wondering if maybe you could speak about what you've done for yourself, like normally, normally in between projects. And then maybe kind of like, what is this new land that we're in now for you? Yeah. Um well, as I mentioned, like coming from a from a more of a fine arts background, I've always found my inspiration in the fine arts world. So in normal circumstances, I like to use that time to go to, you know, photo exhibits, to go to painting exhibits, um, to we are so fortunate to live in a place like New York where there's something happening every single day or every you know weekend, like there's always something cool to to check out. Um, and I make that uh, a focus when I travel to a new place too, to try to see like a local exhibit and, and try to check out like local artists and what they're up to. Um, and it's something that even if I weren't doing this job, I think I would just have that as a part of my, my life because it's something that I enjoy doing. Um, and obviously it's something that I can't really imagine happening right now because we are under this COVID umbrella so we can't leave our, our homes. Um, I dearly miss checking out exhibits with friends. Like I dearly miss going to museums with friends and going to galleries with friends because it was a big part of like the social meetups that we used to have but it was also like a breath of fresh air for me so that the visual world didn't become repetitive in the projects that I was doing. Because like you said, we get caught up in the things that we do for money. And a lot of times the things that we do for money start to look exactly the same day in or day out or week after week or month after month. Um, I work in the indie world, but I also work in like the commercial and branded world where, um, you know, again, the, the intention is to make things look good and look like, they're done at a high standard and it's a quality product, but it's not necessarily the most like creatively or like visually engaging thing. So to separate myself from that, I like to have something else to look at that can, you know, stimulate me in a, in a different manner. So during COVID it's been, um, you know, it's, it's like finding those things from, the ease of my home and phone. Um, I love photography and I was, I was part of, and I'm still part of this um, uh, like photography relief market initiative where a local Brooklyn gallery um, chose a bunch of photographers and they showcase their work and they've been selling their work. Um, and through that um, it's, it's, been a great way to discover the work of other local photographers um, and following them on Instagram and kind of seeing what their trajectory was like and what their journey was like as as uh, artists and as filmmaker uh, image makers um, so that's been a, a cool part of it I've reached out to a lot of people that I've never met in real life but just because I've always admired their work from the shadows of Instagram um, I think that COVID has been this like, <laughs> like a lot of like filter, like no filter, like a lot of barriers falling, like you feel like every single um, Insta story is for you to comment on, like I try to not be creepy, but I have found myself like reaching out to a lot of people who are, you know, more or less at like at my level and I think will respond and some of them do. And it's been kind of neat to just have these like small conversations, but to have this like moment of connection with another person, maybe across the globe because they posted a really cool photo and just be like, yo, what are you all about? Like, what's this photo about? How did you do this? Um, and I think that's, that's kept me sane because I know that people are still like, they're still creative, they're still active and maybe there was never re really a barrier 
before this. Maybe we were just like too in our own worlds to make that first step to, to reach out and to connect with somebody else. Um, so that's been kind of like a cool, cool thing of some kind of silver lining <laughs> in this entire ordeal. Yeah, I have to say that's the, that's really the crux of it is the, the kind of adaptability of your lifestyle and your, your career and your industry. And I know that's, you know, how I'm trying to work my way through it of, you know, how do you still, you, you know, say you go to museums and you have a social interaction and you can't go to museums and you can't get that social interaction. So how do you find a new way to, to still feed that desire and feed how that fuels you? Uh, and I know for myself, the very least I can do is at least to have this little series, like on a little shelf. So we could like just talk about our community. And I think that's a huge um, part about that. Um, do you want to maybe elaborate more about how you stay connected with your community, whether it is social media or maybe like activist organizations? Yeah, um, well, one of my, like a personal saving grace for myself has been that um, a year ago, myself and two other DPs, Catherine Castro and Lisa Gipseva, both of whom you might know because they're very awesome people. Um, the three of us about a year ago, we were kind of like fed up uh, with not having enough creative opportunities to shoot on film. And we were like, we're tired of waiting for the right project to fall on our laps. Like, why don't we just do something ourselves? So I wrote a short script and we combed through it and we each decided which section of it we were going to shoot. Um, and this became this very like collaborative, like three DPs co-shooting and also co-directing. Um, because once we cast our actress and it's, it's one actress, no dialogue, um, pretty, pretty contained script. Like we knew our limitations, but we, um, took turns directing the actor and, and I kind of like oversaw the whole thing, but everybody really, um, wanted to flex those creative muscles and we took turns like gaffing for one another. We took turns loading, um, we had a steady cam op and we had a producer and we had a grip. But apart from that, we all kind of like moved around the set and, and did a little bit of everything. Um, weirdly enough, the, the story is about a woman in total isolation after the apocalypse. <laughs> um, you know. But yeah, but during COVID, you, I think you mentioned to me off, off camera that yeah. uh, you've been editing it now. Yeah, so, so you know, we, we shot this a year ago and I did an assembly cut shortly afterwards, but then our lives kind of took over our lives as DPs. So we, each one of us had a crazy erratic schedule. Like we were never in the same place at the same time. It was really difficult to meet in person. And I don't want to say that the project like fell by the wayside, but it definitely wasn't getting the attention that it deserved. Um, and when, quarantine started, it actually created the perfect storm for us to finally give it the love that it needed. And we started working with our editor. We, we hired an editor. We started working with our editor remotely. Um, you know, she, she did all these, like it's an experimental piece and she did a lot of experimental edits with it. Um, Louisa and she's phenomenal. And we finally, we were picture locked about a month ago. And since then we have been working very closely with our sound designer and our composer. It's been a really interesting foray into like directing um, a, a sound designer. Like none of us have experience with that as DPs. This is a totally new world for us. We spent weeks just watching films together over you know netflix party and and even like through zoom and recommending movies to one another and kind of like trying to make this technology work so that it was just like us being in a room together and watching these films for reference um and building up our our sound vocabulary and figuring out like what it is that we want from the sound design and how to communicate with our our sound designer and composer adam um, and we're getting really close. We're, we're, we're getting another edit from him in a few days. Um, and then we're going to move on to color. So color is going to be a lot of fun because obviously that's our like bread and butter and we can't wait to like jump into that. Um, but like I said, it's been a saving grace because not only has it 
fulfill this really nice like social interaction that you know I see um, these women who are very important to me and who are friends in, in real life and real times um, but I talk to them almost every single day like we have meetings pretty much every week we watch movies together we send each other references um, but we also have a project that we're working on and that um, gives us a sense of like structure and routine during a time where it could very easily become unraveled if you don't have some kind of schedule to keep you going. So it is not only good for the project, but I think it's good for her own sanity. <laughs> and it's been awesome. a very um, serendipitous, you know, timing. And I'm very thankful for them and for, for it. That's, that's ex so exciting and awesome. <laughs> Can't wait to see that answered the question. It kind of answered the it question. Did. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's nuts is that um, I've noticed now and in the interviews that I've had and also just the conversations I've had with friends and colleagues um, off camera uh, is that uh, they're just these kind of new, like surprising ways that you build routine in your life again uh, and things that you never really had time for now, but you never really had time for. But now it's, it's interesting to see where that energy goes. Um, I know I've been doing the same thing, at least in terms of uh, watching movies that I've always wanted to watch or watch movies that I just never got around to watching uh, and really kind of refueling the yeah. inspiration for it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I have uh, another question for you. Uh, would you say there's certain movies or certain cinematographers that you can always go back to and be like, oh, I love their work. Like, it's just always like fun to watch or... I feel like it's weird to say fun because some movies are really dark, but that can still be fun. But you know, it's really in like inspiring and exciting. Like you can always like, oh, I can count on that guy. So like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's like, so again, I, I, I came into filmmaking um, not really understanding like who does what um, and watching movies. Cause I just like, I love the movie for what it was. And then it was almost like once I, learned a little bit more about the craft of cinematography. I actually went back and, and rewatched these movies for the cinematography specifically. And then I started seeing um, a lot of the same names and I'm just like, oh, okay. They're putting like a stamp on the thing that they're doing and then they're getting higher and then they're working with the same director. Okay, I'm starting to understand how this is all like, how this all works. Um, I think like one of the, uh, one of the first, films that affected me I think on a on a personal like a aesthetic level where I was just like oh movies can also be this and not necessarily like mainstream or palatable to everybody was um uh Hunger and mm -hmm. Hunger is Steve McQueen and he also came out of like the fine arts world so he's an interesting filmmaker because he doesn't do things the way you expect things to be done. And Hunger is a very difficult film to, to watch. And the pacing is absolutely insane. And it, it, this was also his first collaboration with uh, uh, his DP, Sean Bobbitt, who is, you know, phenomenal. And, and that, like, led me down this wormhole of their collaboration together um, and of course they did, you know, they did 12 Years a Slave together and um, they did, uh, I'm like obviously brain farting right now. But Wait, are you ready for some like crazy Christina interview trivia? Yes. yes. <laughs> the very first set I worked on, I was just a PA or an intern or something just like wandering around set like, do you want a water? I don't know what I was even doing. <laughs> um, Sean Bobbitt was the, the cinematographer for it was uh, The Place Beyond the Pines with um, directed by Derek Seen, Seen France. Yeah. This little production, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Oh my internet. God. Um, and it's just funny to me too, because it's like, there were so many things, like I was like, I felt like I was like a cartoon character. Like some people already say my eyes are large, but I was like, must have been, like my eyes must have been this God. big. I was just like, Sean Bobbitt, Derek Seen France. Uh, oh Ryan, God. Ryan Gosling, Bradley Cooper. Ryan Gosling would be like at the bottom of that list. I would be like, Sean. <laughs> I know. I just to me, I was just. If anything, it was like uh, my first foray into like seeing behind like the circus. Yeah. 
um, what is it? Not tarps, but like curtains. It was like the yeah, circus yeah, curtains. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, who are these crazies? I'm one of them. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's just nuts because again, like you, it's really awesome to rewatch something once you've, I don't know, it's like you go through certain layers of your life and layers of your career and then you rewatch something. You're like, oh my God. Like, yeah, oh, it's this a phenomenal movie. I didn't realize Sean Bob even was the DP on that. Yeah. Uh, it's so exciting. It's, uh, yeah, it, again, it was like, I, I saw Hunger, I don't, I don't know exactly when it came out, but I don't think I was in college yet. Like, I, I certainly wasn't viewing it through the lens of a filmmaker or an aspiring filmmaker. I'm pretty sure I was just a viewer. Um, but it was one of those films that gutted me, as it should, yeah. um, but gutted me in the... Um, structural sense too because it was a very different kind of movie mm. than what you typically see on tv and I, I saw it on tv it was whatever weird like ifc or some channel um and i was just like oh this structure is weird so for for a long time if anybody asked me like the kind of movies that i wanted to make that was always in the back of my mind because mm. i was like i want to i want to do that i want to make something like that watchable you know mm, that's a weird way of putting it oh, maybe no, I'm, maybe I'm edit that. It. no but but he does he, he does strange because he did shame as well and shame is another one of those like brilliant but borderline like i don't know if i could sit through this <laughs> and that's what's really exciting it's like when you uh can piece apart and still find so cohesive a story that is so visual and how yeah. the visuals of the story it's yeah. just so intertwined. Like, and again, kind of going back to um, when you kind of dissect cinema and like really look at these aspects and it's almost if you could just put the camera over here and like just pull all the ingredients apart. Yeah. But they like just taste so much better when you don't think about it or when you do think about it and they just work so well. And that's just yeah. really exciting when they are a bit, I feel like I've gravitated towards certain productions like that uh, when it's not, you know, it's something that's not typical. Yeah, yeah. Um, but speaking of not things typical, uh, another trivia about um, the place beyond the pines was that uh, beyond all the like the marvel of that memory in my life, I think that was we were shot in the summer of 2010, 2011. I can't believe you worked on that. How did I not know? I don't know. It was not. <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure that it was an all male camera crew, mm -hmm. with the exception of I'm pretty sure I have to fact check myself but I'm gonna say it anyways I'm pretty sure Kai Hall was the film loader uh, and um, she's a pretty well respected uh, union member now uh, and she's been first day seeing for a while um, and if anything there's like this little like I wasn't even really into camp like I've been into photography my whole life but I didn't really know where I was going with the film business right and I just remember seeing at some point like there was a woman holding the film and I was like okay that's that's over there that's pretty cool that's always like a wild thought. yeah I'm just curious if you have like I mean I feel like that's such a question I feel like that's like a Sundance question but like there is you know obviously a, a lack of diversity in the film business and it's shifting a lot now because people are more public about it people are talking about it uh writing about it uh and I mean I I feel like we could talk all day but if you want to like cover just a little bit about your experience as a female cinematographer um, I think it's kind of like, cause I wanted to, sorry, my Zoom's doing a weird thing. It's like frozen again. Hold on. Are you, you're, you're seeing me, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're okay. Okay. Um, uh, right. So this, this will tie into it. This will definitely tie into it. Um, <laughs> cause another one of those, another one of those movies that really inspired me was, uh, was the Rover. And the rover was shot by Natasha Breyer. And Ooh. it was before, again, I, I think I, I, did, I definitely did see this one through the lens of a filmmaker. Um, but it was before I had gotten into the habit of like looking up the DP. And the very next film of hers that I saw was Neon Demon. 
And I think there was, you know, there, there, there was definitely an ASC magazine like article about Neon Demon. And I, I did a d deep dive into that. And I was just like, wait, this is the same woman who shot the rover. I fucking love that movie. And, and I went back and I rewatched it. Um, and then I, I, I did a deep dive into her work and I saw a bunch of like short films that she'd done. She's done like a ton of music videos that are all very like, crazy high production value very very beautiful and I was blown away by her range first of all it was one of those moments of like a woman <laughs> and possibly one of the one of the first like women DPs that imprinted on me and I was just like oh, um it's possible there's someone out there you know um and and of course like through the years I've I've known many many more women who do this but she was definitely the first one to to make that impression on me and and to give me somebody who's like oh this is somebody who who looks like me who does the thing that I want to do and um you know that's a very important thing because if if you see it then you can be it you know and um that's a, an important psychological like marker in anybody who who has a goal that it's so much more difficult to envision yourself in that place if there's no one who looks like you in that department um and for a long time when i was an undergrad and when i was first starting out and working on all these small shoots it was a lot of all male crews and it was very difficult for me to imagine myself in the place of this you know older white dude who wasn't giving me the time of day. Like it just wasn't, there was such a big disconnect between where I was and where I wanted to be. And with that person not being anything like me or not having any of like the the, the background that I had and the life experiences that I had and, and all of that. And it was a huge hurdle to step over because we all deal with imposter syndrome. And I think that it's, um, that imposter syndrome is especially heightened when you don't see other people like yourself in the crew. Um, it really starts to like gnaw at you and, and it, you know, not necessarily like that you're uncomfortable because I've, I've been lucky enough to like never been made to feel uncomfortable by, by any means. But yeah, that psychological disconnect is just, it's something that starting out you really struggle with because you have difficulty like placing finding your place in that world um so seeing her work and seeing how you know good she was at taking any kind of story and taking any kind of topic and just going full throttle into that genre and into that like look and into that aesthetic was so inspiring to me it's like she can do anything she's asked of of her you know it's like it doesn't matter if she had done um high-end commercial you know this she could do like a really gritty indie or it doesn't matter if she had only done like gritty indie she could do this like very polished like neon demon look like it's you know she can do anything and and that's why it was so important for me to for for me to see that um and it was a really formative moment um for me but recently as I've you know as I've started working more and more and I've, I've focused exclusively on cinematography I'm seeing those crews change and I'm seeing you know so many of the women that I look up to are you know they're 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 accessible it's no longer somewhere like way over there it's it's people that I can go and have a coffee with <laughs> you know it's people that I've been fortunate enough to opt for it's people that I've been fortunate enough to like be in a room with at um you know some kind of uh meeting or, or some kind of like festival or whatever it, it that gap seems to be smaller and smaller um and I think it's just it's awesome that more and more women are are in that workplace and that it doesn't feel like such a scary, mysterious line of work to be in. And it feels a lot more welcoming and, and inclusive. And I know we're not definitely not there yet. <laughs> There's a lot of work to be done, but um, I have seen it grow since I was a student, you know, 10, 10, 11, 12 years ago. So. Well, Nona, I want to thank you so much for your time. We could like keep talking forever, but I'm going to have to stop recording at some point. <laughs> um, but again, just thank you for your time. And I just feel like it's really exciting to talk 
to industry members and also friends uh, and somehow get through this. And yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you for your time. <laughs> oh, but before we go, if there's anything else you'd like to say or like offer up to the world, do you have, I don't know, or just say hi and bye. I don't know. But. No, just, I, I don't know. Oh God, I didn't prepare any words of wisdom. Just <laughs> stay sane, no matter what that means to you. Just, you know, or don't. Just let it all hang loose. <laughs> or don't. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay. Thank you, Dota. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>